Thank you for the introduction, Margarita, and thank you very much for having me here today. So in the time it takes me to say this sentence, your body will have finished growing about five million new cells. And in each of those cells, all of the DNA has been replicated. And DNA replication is really important because DNA replication errors are one of the early drivers for genome instability. And we have methods to look at how a group of cells replicate their DNA on average. But we really don't have a way to see how this happens in individual molecules. So the purpose of this research is to use nanopore sequencing to find out how DNA replicates in individual molecules, and we made a method that we call DNA Scent. So before I get into it, I just want to introduce our team. I wrote the DNA Scent software. All the experiments, doesn't work, you're about to see today were done by Caroline Mueller in our group. Our group leader is Conrad Nydasinski at the Dunn School of Pathology, and we all, it's okay, don't worry about it. I can just point, yep. And we also collaborate with Jared Simpson at the University of Toronto. So DNA replication is fundamentally a stochastic process. So in yeast, budding yeast, S. cerevisiae, DNA replicates from discrete sites called origins of replication. And I'm showing you a diagram here of S. cerevisiae chromosome 6, where all the origins of replications are marked with a dot. The bigger the dot, the earlier in S phase that origin will tend to fire. And the more yellow the dot, the more efficient the origin. So the higher the probability it has of firing in a given cell cycle. Now, when an origin fires, it starts a bidirectional replication fork that moves in either direction down the chromosome to replicate the nascent strand. And using next generation sequencing methods, we can plot when positions along the chromosome replicate on average. So the x-axis here is chromosomal coordinate, and the y-axis is the position in S phase when, on average, that position will have replicated. Note that in this field, we tend to invert the y-axis, so origins are peaks, and then the curve moves away. But under this ensemble average is a whole population of cells, each of which is doing this just a little bit differently. And most importantly, if some error happens down here, we're not going to be able to observe it by looking at the ensemble method. So I certainly don't need to remind this audience how nanopore sequencing works, but I just want to re-emphasize that nanopore sequencing goes from DNA molecule to current signal to base calls. So we can look at these current signals and maybe find some information here. So we hypothesized that if we take thymidine and you swap out this rather inert methyl group for an electronegative halogen, BRDU, this might cause some disturbance in the nanopore current signal that we could detect. Now, if you were able to do that, what might you be able to do? Well, if we have some chromosome that's undergoing replication, this example just has four origins on it, if we spike in some BRDU to replicating DNA, the DNA polymerase will incorporate the BRDU into the nascent strand. If we chase that with thymidine, when replication has finished, if we can detect BRDU, we should be able to observe these bands of incorporation of analog in the nascent DNA. And notice that these bands are centered around origins of replication that fired in this particular molecule. So if you can detect these bands, you can infer something about how replication happened. So Caroline took an S. cerevisiae strain that can't make its own thymidine, and she let it go through the cell cycle in media with different concentrations of BRDU. We verified that BRDU was incorporated into the nascent DNA by the DNA polymerase using mass spec, and then we used Jared's tool NanoPolish to gather up all the events that corresponded to a particular sixmer and plot them. And what you see is if we have 0% BRDU, that blue curve, the events correspond very nicely with the ONT poor model. But as we increase the concentration of BRDU, this thymidine peak goes down, 
and this new peak starts to go up. So we infer that this is the signal caused by BRDU. Now, if we train a Gaussian mixture model on that, we can find the distribution of this BRDU containing SIXMER. And now we have some notion of expectation of the signal we expect to see from a BRDU containing SIXMER. So we use an HMM-based detection approach. And if we compare the ensemble results of that approach to BRDU IP, where BRDU is incorporated near origins, we find that it matches ensemble data really well. But of course, this is exactly not the point of doing this. We're using our method, turning it into ensemble data, and comparing it with ensemble data. So we really want to be able to look at single molecules. And of course, because it's nanopore sequencing, we can. So here are four reads that map to S. cerevisiae chromosome 6. And each read has a top portion, which is the individual BRDU calls made by DNA sent, whether this region of DNA was BRDU positive or thymidine only. And we also quantify the frequency with which BRDU was incorporated in a particular region. So in this case, we see that this read is only thymidine. This read has two regions of BRDU incorporation. This one has two, and this read has one. And most importantly, those BRDU positive regions correspond very well to the positions of known origins of replication. So ORI 606 and ORI 607. So in these reads, we can infer that these origins fired in these molecules. Now, because we can calculate frequency of BRDU, we see the frequency of BRDU incorporation highest near the origin, and then we see it trailing away as BRDU starts to run out. So you can also use that to infer fork direction and fork velocity. Now, it's quite helpful to use that against a situation where we have some biological expectation of what the fork direction should be. And a really good way to do that is with rDNA in cerevisiae. So rDNA in cerevisiae consists of a bunch of 9.3 KB repeats. And each of those repeats has an origin on it, and it has a replication fork barrier. So it's going to prevent rightward moving forks. And the reason it does that is so you prevent any collisions between replication and transcription machinery. So if we use DNA scent to plot the BRDU signal across one of these 9.3 KB repeats, what we see is the highest peak is at the origin, as we should expect. The signal trails away gradually to the left from the leftward moving fork, but the signal trails off quite sharply to the right, almost though the fork is hitting something. So this is the replication fork barrier that it's hitting. And this is an ensemble measurement using DNA scent, but we can also, of course, look at this in single molecules, and we see this effect as well. Gradually, the signal trails away to the left, and the fork hits something as it moves to the right. Now, nanopore sequencing reads tend to be very long. So this opens up a lot of really exciting possibilities. So here's a 160 KB read that maps to S. cerevisiae chromosome 16. Uh, we've gone as high as about 250 KB reads. And what's exciting about this is you cover really quite a large portion of the chromosome, so you can detect multiple origins being activated on the same read. So in this particular read, we see three origins that are fired, and again, they correspond to the locations of known origins in cerevisiae. So this opens up a lot of questions. People tend to think that origin initiation might be independent of one another, but with this method, you can look at how origin activation is regulated in six, which is quite exciting. So what does this enable? So we can make whole genome maps of DNA replication, we can detect very low efficiency origins, so origins that have a very low probability of firing in any one cell cycle, because we can do this genome-wide and look for all the rare events. And because of nanopore's really long read length, we can also do this in repetitive sequencing. 
uh, repetitive sequences. So we've just shown how you can do this in RNA. You can do this in centromeres, although in yeast they're short enough that you can just map across it anyway. But in other organisms, it would be quite repetitive and difficult to do. And you can also do this in telomeres. Because of that really long read length, you can have multiple origins activated on the same read. So you can start to ask questions about whether origin firing truly is independent or not. And you can also apply this to higher organisms as well. So we just published this in Nature Methods last month. Uh, the DNA Sense software is available on my GitHub page. And this is quite a hot topic. So there's two other very nice preprints on this as well that you should read. And I think you're going to hear about one of them in a little bit. So with that, I just want to thank BBSRC, Wellcome Trust, St. Cross, NVIDIA, and Microsoft for funding. Uh, Paolo Scramantis and Benedict did the mass spec. Um, our group is headed by Conrad Nidasinski. All the experiments you saw today were done by Caroline Mueller. And Jared Simpson has been a big, big help over the years. So many, thankful, many thanks to, to all those people. And thank you.